<laughs> we're uh, we're going to kind of continue on the theme that we've been on over the last few weeks, but before we do, I just can't help but think that that the Lord wants to do a little something with what just occurred, that whole idea of of uh, the Lord is saying to uncover my enemies, that whole riff that he, he was doing there. You know, that happens to a believer whether we uncover it or we allow God to uncover it. At some point, because he loves you, it's going to get uncovered. And so one of the things the Lord is saying is uncover it, you know. And, um, and so I think we're supposed to pray, and I'm just going to ask God uh, on behalf of the congregation, if you, if you just want to hold your hands out in front as if you were receiving something from the Lord, it's just a posture, nothing super spiritual, just a posture of receptivity to the Lord. Father, I just say, Lord, give revelation to each individual. The destructive, the destruction that is, that is planned against us, no matter how it comes, no matter what form, whether it is sin or whether that was brought on in time by Adam and Eve and creation and culture and mankind is just exponentially wallowed in that sin or whether it's a choice we make or it doesn't matter God but there is a plot of death over each one and we just pray life and abundance in Jesus name Father I pray that we have revelation of the enemy's pl plots that you would shine light on that and I pray God that we'd recognize where our help comes from that you're our fighter you're our guard. You're our defender. So, Father, as we are aware, we can speak your kingdom to those things, and they are cast out. You say what we bind on earth will be bound in heaven if we agree with you. So, Father, I pray that in Jesus' name in every regard. Everybody said amen. 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 Cool. Well, as as I've been uh, as we've been talking about freedom and and, and we're talking about moving in, in in the Lord and we're coming into a fast on February first. We're going to begin a fast. Cheryl's going to bring some more information about that at the end of the service. But I just wanted to kind of answer a question, uh, and it's really answerable through. Story after story after story after story after story throughout the Bible. That's one reason I just said jokingly earlier that, you know, uh, we're going to get to the whole thing here in a minute. But it's born out of this. It's born out of the idea or the thought, is there hope in a, in a, in a corrupt culture? Let me ask it again. Is there hope in a corrupt culture? Yes. And, and the, re the reason I want to answer that question and talk about that question is, is, is you know, I, I read the news, and, you know, I, 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 I do that every morning. I, I want to know what's going on. You know, some of it's hard to read. Um, but, it, you know, it's just packed full of, of bad information. You know, what you find is, is a story today is refuted tomorrow. And this story is refuted by this group, and this group refutes that. And it, anybody else find it hard to believe anything? I mean, we live in a culture where it's just hard to know what is not a lie or what is not deceit or what is not tainted by point of view. And it has nothing to do with bear witness to the truth. Well, the reason I got into that question is, is when I studied one of the stories, which is the story of Nehemiah, and I, and I saw God's work as, as Stephen mentioned earlier he, he was talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness and how God worked that out how God dealt with Nehemiah and the the and he dr dealt with Jerusalem and the whole nation of Israel as he judged them for beginning to agree with the culture versus 
doing things his way. It got to the point where he allowed a, a heathen king to capture them, where Nebuchadnezzar grabbed them, and for 70 years they were in captivity. And you, and you see this whole destruction of Israel. But how many of you know that God allowed that destruction of Israel so that he could redeem it? His plan is good no matter what. What he's about is, is to reveal his love even in tough circumstances. That's kind of what Stephen was getting to when he did transition, is that everything God does has a redeeming quality. God is not, he's not a condemner. He is a God that wants to bring redemption and healing. He, he wants to bring something good out of something bad. He's a good God, right? And so, and so we see how he's working that through in the story of Nehemiah. In the story of Nehemiah, of course, he uses Ezra, the book of Ezra, the book of Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and others. All are contemporaries speaking to a culture and a government about the ways of God. There's a voice this coming, a voice of God, this coming to a culture, all with the intent of redemption. It is all uh, being done so that God's way can happen. And so in that, in our culture, I, I just want to make sure as believers, as we see uh, what God does there, and I'll talk about it a little bit, also I want to talk about Esther. If you haven't read Esther in a long time, I know that's not a book that everybody says, hey! I think I'll go read Esther. I mean, John gets overread and Esther gets underread. John's a lot longer. <laughs> Esther's only 10 chapters. And it's a great story. But it's a great story of a woman who heard from the Lord and, and followed God. And so I just want us to come to agreement that we believe as a church and as believers that God's love can be expressed in the midst of of corruption and confusion. Do you believe that? Do you believe that we were born to ex be an expression of the love of God during confusion and corruption? Matter of fact, matter of fact, these are the times when we ought to be able to speak the loudest by speaking the softest. There ought to be a great disparity between the lies of the culture and the dis destruction and the church. There should be, there should be this, this large gap of expression of how it's been expressed and what's been expressed. So I, I just want to uh, bring us to a place that we believe and know and understand that God's love can be expressed in the midst of what we see. Not only that, but I want to say to you that every person that we see, whether it be Esther, whether it be Nehemiah, whether it be all the prophets, had this idea that they had to fast and begin to pray to, to get the purposes of God for them so that they could actually be the voice of God so that when they got into the midst of a culture or a government situation or wherever they were, whether it's workplace or family or whatever it is, that that culture was able to bring redemption. And however that brought redemption, however that redemption element was brought forward, was brought forward by the Spirit of God. You see, even in uh, Zechariah, when he, he's talking about Zechariah, he's talking about Zerubbabel, he's talking about Nehemiah, he says, he says about Nehemiah, man, I'm pleased. He says about Zechariah, my eyes are on you and I'm pleased. The eyes of the Lord have roamed to and fro throughout the whole earth, and they've seen you and they're pleased. I am excited that the plumb line, the measuring stick, is in the hand of you, Zerubbabel. Th those things, the eyes of the Lord are looking, and he's using them, but he says this. It doesn't happen by might, and it doesn't happen by power. It happens by my spirit, says the Lord. In other words, none of these men are able to accomplish the task. All they do is they are the voice of, and they position themselves in agreement with God, and that actually has the power with the anointing of the Holy Spirit on it to change a culture, even the government. You know, God came to change the culture and the government. Everybody, oh. God came to change the culture and the government. 
Scripture tells us that the government is going to be on the shoulders of Jesus. He's going to come back. Now, here, here we sang, ain't no grave going to hold my body down. Isn't that good? Man, southern rock is like perfect. How many would agree with the pastor on southern rock? All right, good. You guys are anointed. The rest of you, I'm not so sure. <laughs> so oftentimes our mindset is, I can't wait for Jesus to come back, neither can I. You know what? I've had two heart attacks, and in those moments, I was like, all right, Jesus, I'm, I'm ready. I guess I'm ready. I mean, I hope I'm ready. I mean, I know you. If you're ready to take me, and I wasn't scared. I was excited. I, 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 the possibility was I was going to get to stay with Liz, or I was going to see Jesus. Either one was good. So I've been face-to-face -face with that, so I'm not just whistling Dixie. I know exactly what that feels like. But there's so much of this idea of I can't wait till Jesus come back that we miss that the reason he hadn't come back is because you're here. The reason he hadn't come back is because we're still here and we're supposed to be doing something. We don't have to live in this corrupt society, this culture that we find ourselves in, in this government environment that we find ourselves in, in fear. Our posture is not supposed to be fear. We are the infusers of hope and, the, and, and love. We are, what, we are the answer to the problem. And we, and we shouldn't answer the problem in the same way the culture is answering the problem. In other words, our attitude and our position should be totally different than what we see around us from the church. It should be different. And so there needs to be this understanding that God has placed us here to bring a shift. And we need to be hope-filled shift-bringers with a posture of meekness, humility, and love. And so I want to examine fr from the book of Nehemiah, understanding that, that we're here to be exposed in the first service to expose the love of God. In the first service, we did baby dedications, which are, you know, I can't hardly take it. I mean, I'm, I'm like a big baby. It's ridiculous. It gets kind of sickening. But, you know, I'm boo-hooing, you know, and praying over these babies and these families that we love and asking the presence of God. And, of course, the Spirit of God loves them babies. And so the Spirit of the Lord is all over it. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. Praying over the families, making a commitment as a church. To, to walk in the way of God. <laughs> and we prayed over each one of those babies, and we said about them, said, Lord, we know before, the before they were formed in the room that you predestined them for purpose. And it's impossible to, to, it's impossible to be fulfilled in this life without actually accomplishing the purpose of God. If you want to be fulfilled, you have to reach your destiny in God. In other words, you have to get a hold of why God created you. You have to understand that you are his ambassador to, of change. You're the truth agent. Not to beat people over the head with truth, but to love them into the idea that only truth brings prosperity and fulfillment. And so we're the truth bearers. And the only way you can do that is, is love. And so... When we, when we see Christianity uh, in our culture, we've got to understand that God's love has been expressed in the midst of corruption and confusion everywhere. In Nehemiah, listen, listen. In Nehemiah, there are two things that God missions of why destruction came to that nation. And the biggest one is this. You bear false witness in my name. In other words... You were a representative of me, and you're lying about each other. You were a representative of me, and you're lying about each other. And I and I and I read the news, and I re, you know I read CNN and Fox News and C-SPAN and all all of them, and they all have different. Just, we live in a culture of bearing false witness. And one of the things the Bible was talking about there is. That culture will bring destruction all by itself. It's going to do it unless we actually repent, unless we uncover and unless we actually are agents of change and can bring change. 
And so Jesus died so that we could change ungodly culture and government. He came to redeem the culture. He came to redeem the government. God is looking for people who will influence the culture for righteousness' sake. He wants us to be a model of righteousness. This is right thinking. Therefore, we cannot live in fear or on the defensive, but we need to continually be on the offensive, expressing the love of God. And so to do that, I wanted to just hit a few topics. First of all, I wanted to just touch on the kind of people and the thing that people bring. First of all, and we've talked about most of these, they infuse hope. They infuse righteousness. There's a right way of thinking. Righteousness is aligning with God. In that message, in that meekness, in that humility, they bring a message of love, which is corrective, which is, you know, brings discipline sometimes. It, it, even God says, I'm going to let your sin bring correction to you. Sometimes God takes his hand off of us so that, so that, our actions and choices bring correction to us. And so, and so there is this message of love. But most of all, there's a message of healing. How many would agree that our nation and our world and people need healing? God is a healer. God, he wants to heal our minds, our, our souls, and our bodies. He, he wants to heal everything about us. But most of all, we're transformed. How we're transformed in his image is in our minds, the way we think. He wants to change that. And so we have a message of healing to the people. And we also have to have this. And, and it's such a, uh, such a touchy word in the church, but there's a message of prosperity. And, and the reason that that's a touchy word is because every time you hear about the prosperity gospel, you, you think that everybody's supposed to be rich, financially rich. And although finances are inclusive in it, what it means is, is that when you prosper, you actually receive the blessing that God wants you to receive or intended because you've aligned yourself with him. In other words, if you've got a failing government or a failing culture, there's a way of alignment that actually can bring victory. Is prosperity. And God doesn't want to harm you. He wants good. He wants good for our government. He wants good for our culture. God doesn't have the ability to want bad. He wants good. And so prosperity is alignment with righteousness. And with righteousness brings good. Right? And he's saying to the church, you're my agent. He said to Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, a whole group of men were saying the same thing. There's a whole group of people, the church, the representative, the voices of God saying there's love, there's healing, there's prosperity with alignment with Jesus. Just align with God. Then health is coming. We're the voice. So in this idea, as we fast and pray, the reason that we call the church to fasting and praying is, is because you have to believe that you're the voice of God. You have to believe that you're the ambassador of Christ. You have to believe that you are a son or daughter of God. You have to believe that that. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You have to believe that you are have the seal. You have to believe that's who you are. And to do that, you have to believe that you can actually communicate with God. Now, in this culture, they would call you nuts. That person actually thinks they can talk to God, and God talks to them. But that's why Jesus died. Jesus died so that veil would be rent from top to bottom, Right? so that we could enter into the Holy of Holies boldly, asking what we would, right? 
So he restored relationship and communication with the Father so that we could talk with him. Now, what you have to believe is that you were predestined. Your destiny depends on your ability to hear the Lord and to follow him. And everywhere that I read in Scripture about culture being changed, about the arts being captured back by by, by, by the church or, or any other cultural thing that, that can be influenced by the church that we need to be uh, the voice of God on. Any of those things, any of those things are influenced by you and me. And the only way that we can do it is through fasting and prayer just like they did. When, when Nehemiah heard of the condition of the culture and the capital and the government, he, he said he began to weep and mourn at the condition of the people. And because he wept and mourned, he put on sackcloth and ashes and began to fast and pray and hear from the Lord. And when he heard from the Lord, he, he went it before the king with, a, with a, a distorted face, which could have cost him his life. And got the favor in the hand of God and began to move out in the Lord. And the Lord prospered him to, to rebuild. But he had instruction and he fasted and prayed. And so the first thing that you have to do and I have to do in our hearts is believe that we can actually hear God give us purpose and mission to bring to our culture the idea of love, hope, healing, and redemption. And that you're on assignment to do that. And if you don't believe that, that's your first place. And then you're going to have to begin to fast and pray and actually ask God to help you hear from him so you can change the environment around you. We had a testimony in the first service. One of our musicians has a friend that he used to play with when he was younger. And he, and he, was a, you know, he, was a, he described him as a liberal who hated God. That was his description, not mine. And he had always hated God. And he was dying of cirrhosis of the liver. And the Lord put it on uh, the heart of uh, his friend. And, and his friend comes to him and begins to, to minister to him. And he begins to become open. And tears are coming. And, and, and openness to God. And understanding that he was created. And understanding this kind of gift. And all those walls were broken down in a minute because you had somebody with a purpose who believed that they heard from God, got back in contact with this guy, went to see him, and the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and there was anointing there, and there's receptivity of Christ. We know that be true, don't we, CC? It happened with your son. It, it, the, <laughs> whether it be in the workplace, no matter whether it be in family, no matter where it is, you're on mission to God to, to bring healing and redemption. Healing and redemption. And, and there's, some, there's some things that there's some common misconception about who God uses. And I just want to go over a few of them. The first misconception that I have, anytime we start thinking about God's purpose and God's um, God's. Um, whole design for you, your destiny being this, this ambassador of joy and peace and love and redemption, is that you're not qualified. Somehow you have disqualified yourself. And the only way that you can come to the conclusion that you're disqualified from this relationship with God that allows you to actually be an ambassador of Christ is to believe that everybody in this scripture was qualified. And nobody in this scripture was qualified. This is the biggest group of misfits ever gathered together in one place. Would you agree? I mean, they are one dysfunctional bunch. Right? What do they have in common? They have a zeal and a love for God and a determination to please Him. And we'll get to that in a minute. So we have this, we have this misconception that all the people in this book that God used to do what we're talking about somehow are qualified. We also have this misconception that their life was perfect. They didn't have the problems we have. 
Well, first of all, let me just give one, and the reason I like him is because Messiah comes through his lineage, and that's David. David was a murderer and an adulterer before God said he's a man after my heart. And the reason God said he was a man after his heart is because God said about David, he'll do everything I tell him to do. Wait a minute. His life was a mess. And when, and when Nathan comes to David and, and gives the prophecy, David said, kill that man. You all remember the story? And, and, and Nathan says, you the man. That's, when, that's the first time you the man was ever mentioned. It's right there in Scripture. You the man. It wasn't on the golf course. <laughs> and David, what did he do? He repented. Boom. Immediately. Because God revealed it to him, and he wanted to please God. He was, he was a mission. Do you know that David's son chased him around trying to kill him? Trying to turn the whole community against him. His life was not perfect. He was a terrible daddy. His kids were a mess. That's a misconception. God said about David, he's a man after my heart. And used him to be the lineage of the Messiah. The seed. We also, and I just kind of cover this one too, we also believe that somehow these people didn't have any problems. I got all these problems, so somehow I can't do the ministry or have this, this mission-mindedness that, God, you just don't know my problem. And these people that couldn't have had those kind of problems, but they did. Well, you know, all those people saw God's promises fulfilled in their life. And I, I just don't see God's promises being fulfilled at a very fast rate in my life. I mean, I've seen some things. I just hadn't seen a whole lot. But a lot of these people didn't see any. And most every one of them never saw the mission that they started ever get finished. They were just this portion of what God was doing. They were just this element of what God was doing. And he began to, to manifest what he was accomplishing over a given period of time. So oftentimes, we want results right now. And we want to see the end of it. We just want to see it done. I want to see it finished. Well, it didn't take but 2,000 years for Jesus to say it's finished. All the fathers of the faith never saw the promises fulfilled that they were involved in. And so if we know all these things to be true, if we know that those are common misconceptions, what traits can we say were about most of the people that were found used by God? First of all, their life was a life of devotion. They were devoted to God. They had zeal. Even Paul had zeal. He was known to have zeal. He was zealous for God before he, he'd even walked in righteousness. He was zealous before God when he wasn't thinking right. And God loved his zealousness, right? And, and he used his zealousness for the benefit. Misaligned zealousness is still misaligned. And God can take your zealousness. He just can't deal with your misalignment. And so these folks had a heart to know what God thought and what he did and to, to agree with him, to submit to that. And they also recognized that God was in the details. Some of you need to hear this. God's in the details of your every issue. He cares about the details of your every issue. And he will give you step-by-step -step ways to move from where you're at. He'll help you move gradually to a place of prosperity. They recognized God was in all the details. They pursued God. They fasted. They prayed. They put on sackcloth and ashes. They, they put themselves in a posture of worship so that they could hear from heaven. All of them's life was a struggle. Every one of them struggled. It wasn't a one that didn't have it on easy peasy. It wasn't easy peasy for any of them. They all struggled. They all had to make hard decisions. Esther had to take her life 
if, if you feel look at what Esther did, now listen, this is a great story. It's in the Bible. I love that these kind of stories are in the Bible. There's this drunk heathen king wants to show off his good-looking wife in front of all the guys. So he invites her in. She says, I ain't going. That's not a good thing with the king. And so the king dethrones her because of the cultural ramifications of her saying no to the king. And so he beat, kicks her to the curb. And so now there's this mission to find the best-looking woman in all the kingdom, virgin. And so they begin to do that. And guess who it is? It's Esther. Now, Esther was raised by her cousin. She was from a totally dysfunctional family that wasn't even alive. And so her cousin is raising her, and he is hearing from the Lord on a continuous basis, helping her, giving, helping her as they fast and pray about saving the nation of Israel, the church and the government. And it comes to a place where Esther finds favor with the king and becomes queen. And then she requests a meeting with him. If you know anything about it, it was as bad as not showing up to a drunk king's request. She was not supposed to ask him for anything. If he wanted to see her, he would have asked for her. And it could have caused her to die. So she took her life in her hands so that she could redeem the king. And it says about Jesus and the spirit that that's who did the work. But there was, there was revelation and there was all kinds of things that happened in the story that God revealed and gave them step-by-step -step ways to actually redeem a whole nation and change a culture. That's Esther in a nutshell. It's, 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 it's the way it is. They, they risked everything, but they didn't waste anything. In other words, they didn't make stupid decisions. They didn't do stupid stuff. They made sure that they heard from God. Let me give you another example. I gave it the other week, and I just think it's, to me it's one of the best things that we can see from Jesus. Lazarus is sick. You all know the Lazarus story, John chapter 9 through 11-ish, right in there. John, I mean, uh, Lazarus is sick. The sisters send a party out to tell Jesus that Lazarus is sick, and they believe he can heal him. And they call him, come heal, come heal your friend. Jesus says, nah, not going, not time. And, and then three days goes by, and he's dead. And Jesus goes, now it's time. Jesus is in communication with the Father getting instructions. How do I know this? Because when he shows up to the tomb, he says, roll the, roll the stone away. This, didn't happen. this is not some pretty Hollywood story. This is life. This is true. This is real. We're supposed to learn something from it. Jesus said, Father, I know you and I have already, this is Alex, I'm giving you the southern version. Father, I know we've already talked. We've already had conversation. You've already given me instruction, and so I'm here. And I'm doing what you said do, but so that they'll know that you sent me, I'm praying this prayer so that they'll know that you and I are in relationship. I'm an ambassador. I'm the anointed one. And he prays, Lazarus come forth, and Lazarus comes forth. Jesus didn't do that on his own. He, he had this vision he had this thing from god that he had instruction beforehand and he's talking about that instruction listen you can have that kind of relationship with the father that's why jesus died that's what fasting and prayer is all about we're going to fast for 40 days and i want you fasting believing that you're going to hear from heaven about your mission your purpose your destiny on this earth like never before. There's going to become clarity. You're going to begin to respond to the details. And as you respond to the details, you're going to see the Spirit of God begin to do things that are much bigger than you so that you can gain confidence in not only your ability to hear from heaven, but God's ability to work on your behalf. 
Because I'm just telling you right now, I believe that signs and wonders follow those who believe because they are emulating the nature and the character of God. And you are it. You're the hope of the world. You're the hope of this culture. You and I. They didn't waste anything. So if we're living a life knowing that, that we're in God's purpose, the thing that we've got to buy into and we've got to understand, and it's said in Scripture, Isaiah 55, 11 says, His word doesn't return void. It can't return without producing. Jesus said, you abide in me and I in you, and you're going to bear fruit, much fruit. And you're going to bear the kind of fruit of that which you hang around with. So I would encourage you to hang around Jesus, or you're going to bear a different kind of fruit. But whatever you abide in. And so, and so <clears throat> if we know that God has purpose, if we know that we're the ambassadors of Christ, if we know that we're sons and daughters of God, then we've got to believe that not only are we called to, to bring his purpose, to infuse his purposes into situations. But we also have to believe that they can't fail. Because this word never fails. And if he gives you instruction, you've got to believe that it's going to prosper. It's going to bring something. Now what God usually does is he either, he either brings judgment on something. But when I say judgment, there's going to be a great judgment. He brings judgment on something in a way that, that will, like he did Israel, that will bring about repentance. In other words, the only reason that judgment comes on something is because he tried, 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 tried to get somebody's attention and they just wasn't going to listen. And so he lets them, he takes his hand off and he lets whatever that is do its work. And it looks like judgment. But the whole reason it's there is to get your attention. It's to let you know how much God loves you. So that you'll actually turn to him because he's your hope. He is love. He is healing. He is prosperity. He'll bring all those things to you if you'll just, if you'll just turn. So, so sometimes he brings something that looks like judgment, but the, the root of that is love. He brings stuff that looks like correction. You, you get discipline. And, and I told the first servant, I'll tell you, you really are the, 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 the person who holds the sleuth gate to the correction. The sleuth gate is the thing in a dam that, that lets the water out, that produces the electricity, and there's somebody that operates. Probably it's probably electrical now, but there used to be something that it would just somebody that would just spin a wheel, and it. And then you're the sleuth gate operator to God's discipline in your life, because God loves you so much that He just wants to shepherd you, and He starts shepherding you first, and if you don't pay Him any attention, He'll break your leg, and carry you around, which is what a shepherd used to do. And if you don't do that, he'll let sin do its work in your life. All so that you'll listen to him and be healed. All so that good can come in your life. All so that you'll know what righteousness is. God, God wants that in our lives. And he's saying, you are the voice of righteousness to a culture and to a government. And the only way that you can be that voice is to become that thing. The only way to victory is transformation. It's the transformation process. Because his purpose always has a redeeming effect. God is in the redeeming business. He wants to redeem something. He wants to make something that's bad and turn it into something that is good. He says, he says Satan comes to Steal, kill, and destroy. But I tell you, I have come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. He, Satan, causes things to happen to you, and he, he does it for evil. But I'll turn what he's doing into good for those who love me and are called according to my purpose. Everything God does has a redeeming effect, even if it starts out judging, even if it starts out correcting. It can look that way, but it also always has a redeeming purpose. His purpose has a moving effect more 
than just it moves something along. More often than not, it doesn't have immediate change. You don't have this fullness of change, just this process that God does in a series of events that actually brings about healing and health. And so you've got to be in, in fasting and prayer and relationship with him to begin to see those redeeming works, the details. Because most of us aren't going to be a finished product tomorrow morning at 7 because we went to this church service this afternoon. But the truth is that his redeeming work in our culture and in our government requires agreement. It requires agreement. Everybody in that book that has success agreed with God. They just agreed with God. They said, yes, Lord, I, I agree with you. I want to know you. I know that my ways aren't your ways and my thoughts aren't your thoughts. I, I, I know that you work things differently than I do. I, I want to be in connection with that. I, I want to do whatever I need to do to make sure that everything I do prospers. And the only way to make it prosper is to align with you, agree with you. You are prosperity. You are my victory. You know, in Nehemiah and all those books of the Bible, and in Esther, but especially in Zechariah when it's talking about this age in, in, in Israel and Babylon, it says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, you insert, you infuse love and righteousness, and God does the work. It's always a supernatural event. So today, when we were singing about shine light on, uncover the things that don't look like you, God. Show me my enemy. Show me that thing that is trying to destroy me. And let me turn to your way so that I can understand love, so that I can understand my hope, so that I can understand healing, and so that I can be an agent of love for you. That's the, that's the church. That's the church. The culture in our government needs us, and God is depending on us to be the messenger. There is no other messenger. We're it until Jesus comes back. It's a great responsibility, and we need to repent. The church, in me, <laughs> there are a lot about me that doesn't look much like God, and I'm getting better and better every day. I'm a work in progress. Why don't you look to the left or the right and say, the pastor's really a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting way too much lip down here from the front row right now. Huh? <laughs> it's a great message for the church. I hope I hope you hear, I hope you hear, and I hope you see it in, in, in the Word of God as you begin to discover some of the Old Testament stuff, and uh, and what God wants to do. Cheryl's going to come and she's going to kind of tie this thing up, and uh, and then pray us out of here. Um, yeah. Don't forget to take up a tithe and offering because we haven't done that yet. So, somebody say amen. amen.